Welcome everyone, including those who are online. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, later the uh, speaker today, Lord Nigel Crisp. Uh, this is the second Douglas R. Wilson Lecture of the School of Public Health. The lecture is named in honor of Dr. Douglas R. Wilson, who is sitting here with us. Uh, he's a former Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta, and he was instrumental in the creation of the School of Public Health 10 years ago. Each year, we invite a distinguished visitor to speak on an important public health issue, either globally or locally. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, and we respectfully um, acknowledge that this is the traditional lands of the First Nation and Métis people. Now I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Lauren Tyrell, who is the chair of the board of the Institute of Health Economics, who is a co-sponsor of this event. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. It is really a pleasure to be here and to co-sponsor this event. There's not many people I have more respect for than Dr. Doug Wilson, and it's awfully nice to be here for this lectureship. And uh, acknowledge that his wife and his daughter are also here today, so uh, it's a nice event. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and the opportunity to bring these greetings. <clears throat> my, as uh, my colleague Dr. Young noted, Along with working at the University of Alberta as a professor and the director of the Li Kai Shing Institute of Virology, I have the honor of being the chair of the board of directors of the Institute of Health Economics. For those of you who might not know about the Institute, it is a unique collaborative effort that brings together senior representatives of government, academia, and industry. Also on our board from the University of Alberta are the esteemed colleagues Walter Dixon, the Vice President of Research, Richard Fedork, our Dean of Medicine, Neil Davies, the Dean of Pharmacy, and Constance Smith, the Chair of the Department of Economics. Our strong relationship with the University of Alberta is not a new one. In fact, we just celebrated 20 years of this collaboration. Our support and partnership in the Douglas Wilson Lecture Series today speaks to our organization's shared vision and goal of advancing sound, evidence-based public <clears throat> health policy. Thank you, Dr. Young, for giving us the opportunity to uh, support this wonderful event. We are interconnected, and global health impacts us all. The problems we face in healthcare in Alberta, in Canada, and internationally are so challenging and complex, they cannot be solved through any system that does not include partnership, sharing of knowledge. Alberta has the ability and the expertise to impact and inspire the future of global health as a leader of evidence-informed public health policy, and importantly, as demonstrated by everyone's attendance here today, in person and online, Alberta has an appetite and an interest and enthusiasm to learn from international friends and leaders. I have no doubt that the insight we will gain today will be carried on with us through our actions, our thoughts, as we tackle projects of tomorrow. On behalf of the members of the board of the CEO, and the CEO, Egan Johnson, and the University of Alberta, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to the Douglas R. Wilson Lectureship, One World, One Health. Uh, thank you, Dr. Young. It is now my privilege to introduce our speaker, Lord Nigel Crisp. Lord Crisp is an independent member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom and a co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on global health. He has many accomplishments in his career. He was chief executive of the National Health Service of England and permanent secretary, which is equivalent to our deputy minister of the Department of Health from 2000 to 2006. He described his time as chief executive of the NHS in his book, 24 Hours to Save the NHS. I'm sure it is a very you know, interesting and, 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 and suspenseful book. Um, more recently, he has worked and published extensively on health in low and middle income countries, particularly in Africa. Among his publications in global health include Turning the World Upside Down, The Search for Global Health in the 21st Century. 
global health partnerships, African health leaders making change and claiming the future. His latest book is called One World Health. And in fact, there is a, an order form in your, with your brochure, and I hope you will all uh, uh, you know, contribute to uh, the well-being of Lord Chris. Um, the, the central thesis of the book is that we need to understand better the things that unite and divide us. The title of his lecture today is One World, Our Health. Lord Chris. Well, thank you very much indeed for that, uh, that wonderful welcome. I didn't realize I was on a book tour, but um, it, it sounds a bit that way, but I'm always very, very grateful for, for such comments. Um, great pleasure to be here. I perhaps should say I have been in Edmonton before, actually, at least two or three times, but the first time was actually in 1970, um, when we have this tradition in the UK called the Gap Year, where between school and university, you wander around the world. I wandered around Canada. Uh, and I, I spent a fair bit of time in Edmonton before actually looking at the audience, before many of you were born, actually looking at some of the audience before your parents were born. But, um, anyway, so, uh, and, and if you come back to a place like Edmonton and you drive around, you don't see many buildings that were here uh, 46 years ago. Anyway, um, as was said, I was chief executive of the NHS in England for a few years. Um, massive organization, biggest health system in the world with 1.4 million employees. So you get the scale of it. Um, as I normally say at this point, but happily I'm now in recovery. Um, and I've spent the last 10 years mainly in Africa and working on issues uh, to do with partnerships between the UK and, and actually met many Canadians, worked with many Canadians um, in Africa from your great outgoing uh, tradition uh, of work around the world that you have. Um, and also um, spent a fair bit of time in, in, in Southeast Asia as well. And as you'll see from this lecture, I've learned a lot in that time. This is uh, very much a two-way thing. And my three great themes in this are to talk about one world health and why we shouldn't talk any more about first world health, second world health, third world health, if you like. Um, secondly, about co-development and about uh, you know, getting rid of this sort of rather outdated notion of development and international development, which is about, you know, in many ways, the West knows best and doing things for other people. Um, but actually, there's an awful lot of space for mutual learning and co-development. And then thirdly, about the topic of health creation which is what I think is the future uh, when we think about health um, everywhere around the world, actually. Um, and it's building on the great traditions of public health. But let's be clear when we start that there are huge differences between richer and poorer countries. This is just a terribly stark example of it. Um, these are the regions of the world, world child mortality rate between 1960 to 2012 by, by region. And you can see child mortality uh, deaths come down dramatically everywhere, but you can also see the big difference, can't you? We are this bottom line. Uh, this, is, um, this is actually high-income countries. You know? We haven't come down as much because actually we weren't in so much trouble. Uh, this, of course, is Africa, and they are still, 50 years on, way higher than we were 50 years ago. There's a very, very big difference in terms of... So when I talk about learning, I've not got some romantic notion. I'm talking about learning from people who are have got a much harder job if they happen to be doing the sort of work we are uh, doing the, 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 than we have. Um, but there are similarities too. This is another interesting graph. Again, I just thought I'd pick up this under five mortality rate and just show you that for uh, a range of countries here from Morocco to Uganda, and I could put Canada uh, and the UK here, that actually for the five levels of household wealth, that wherever you are in the world, if you're in Uganda and you're in the poorest quintile, your children have got less chance of getting to five than if you're in the richest quintile. And that's the same in Morocco, it's the same in Canada. So we have the same sets of issues. The social gradient, uh, as it has been called, as I'm sure people are well aware, um, is alive and well and everywhere in the world. But again, let me just go back again briefly for, for differences. And bear in mind that when you're thinking about, and I think very often about Africa, but low middle income countries, um, they're in the grip of four epidemics, uh, infectious diseases, maternal mortality, which is still extraordinarily and appallingly high trauma, by which I, I, I mean physical trauma, let alone mental health, uh, and non-communicable diseases. And all of that is complicated by these extraordinary environmental factors of poor water, nutrition, disability, conflict, climate change, poverty, powerlessness. And then that group of diseases which um, you only find in, in, in the poorest countries of the world, um, 
the, the, the guinea worm, the lymphatic filariasis, the onchocerasis, river blindness, and, uh, and so on, which a group of scientists about five years ago named neglected tropical diseases in a wonderful marketing ploy. And, and as a result, we're now starting to see some money coming into that. Um, but what people often say about them is they are neglected tropical diseases, but actually they're the diseases of neglected people. Um, and, you know, so there's, there's a huge difference. So when we're making comparisons between comfortable Alberta and comfortable England, uh, uh, when we sometimes don't always feel that comfortable, um, we are talking about very, very different circumstances. But, as has already been said, um, there is a huge, we are interdependent. And these are just some of the dimensions on which we're interdependent. New and resurgent uh, infectious diseases. We already heard the mention of SARS, and of course you had your own dreadful experience with that. Um, but also think about extreme disease-resistant TB. Um, we in richer countries thought we had it beat uh, 25 years ago or whenever it was, and it's certainly come back and is, uh, uh, and we know, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the great problems of antimicrobial resistance around the world. These are shared problems, and they're not going to be sorted out in the rich countries and, uh, and not in the poor countries. It's, it's everywhere. This great epidemic, sometimes called silent epidemic of non-communicable diseases, um, uh, everything to do with, uh, with, with cancer or diabetes, which is growing so rapidly uh, around the world. And, and actually, whilst we in our, in, our, in our rich countries know pretty well how to deal with infectious diseases, we're still only learning about the best ways to actually deal with uh, non-communicable diseases, and we can all learn together, and I'll pick up that point a bit more. Um, universal health coverage, we're all struggling with making sure that we can provide some level of health coverage for our, uh, our, our citizens. Even your neighbours to the south have got onto this and are thinking about universal health coverage. I always thought it was an interesting contradiction in their, in their policy that their, uh, their international development work promoted universal health coverage in countries all over the world, but not necessarily back in, in, in the US. Anyway, we won't go there. Um, but, uh, but the point about universal health coverage is the same wherever you are. It's actually about how can you get the best out of your resources to deliver to everyone and actually make sure you do deliver to everyone um, and not just to the middle classes, which is, of course, uh, what so often happens. Climate and environmental change, well... Everything travels across administrative boundaries. We're, we're all in trouble from some of those issues, uh, as we know. And then, of course, the issue of staffing and, and shared resources. Um, the fact that actually there is a global market for health workers, uh, including public health workers, public health professionals, um, and naturally they will gravitate towards the richest parts of the world and away from the poorest parts. And we need to do something to work out how we do that, how, how we work some of that out in a better way. Um, so that's the sort of big introduction. There are differences, but my goodness, there are some real similarities and real shared issues we've got to work together on. So let me pick up from there into what I, I think of as, for us as a world, if you like, we've got some policy choices. And I could stand here and I could be terribly positive. I think there's a terrific positive dynamic in the world at the moment. There's something called the Sustainable Development Goals. Do people know what the Sustainable Development Goals are? I think I'm getting lots of uh, nods around, but these were signed up to in September last year by 192 nations as being the 17 goals for the next 15 years um, to, for the world to move on. And one of them, of course, was health. But what was interesting is that 15, uh, 16 out of the 17 relate to health. Um, they're about gender balance. They're about improving the environment. They're about all kinds of things that have impact on health. And what you see underlying that, and a lot of the global policies at the moment, is you see that we're moving on in a way that public health people have always moved on from, but we're moving on to an understanding that health is not just a biological and a physical factor, but is a biopsycho and indeed social, and actually you could well argue biopsychosocial environmental issue. And that understanding is now starting to be there at the highest level in global policy. And that's really interesting. And in my country, for example, I don't know about it in your country, in my country, we're really understanding how important mental health is. Um, and actually, mental health has got a huge push. In fact, actually, you had some members of our royal family here, didn't you, recently, I think. Well, whatever you think of that, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> um, but, um, but actually, those young royals have really been pushing this issue of mental health in a very impressive and, I think, important way, in as much as they are role models for, 
for others and we're beginning to understand how important it is and how that affects our lives in so many different ways. And it seems to me that there's a new understanding there and it's implicit in those sustainable development goals. It's implicit in so many of the global policies that are coming out of, of, uh, of, of commissions at the moment. There's many new partnerships. There's a lot of innovation going on, extraordinary innovation. Go to India if you want to see some of the extraordinary innovation. Um, there's improved knowledge. Um, and actually, there's massive investment. Health, by many measures, is the uh, largest legal industry in the world. I think there are larger, larger illegal ones, probably to do with guns and, uh, uh, and, uh, and illegal drugs. Um, but it's the largest legal industry in the world, and it's growing globally at 5.2% in, in financial terms a year. And in Southeast Asia, it's growing at 8.1%. Massive investment coming in health. Very different sort of situation in Southeast Asia to, to, the, to the cramped economies of, of Europe who are trying to hang on to our universal health coverage whilst others are expanding in, in, in this way. Um, but also extraordinary research. I mean, we all know the stories of things like childhood cancer and how you know, survival rates have changed extraordinarily over a, uh, over a period. And the new drugs of the last 25 years, uh, the changes that are starting to be made. So there's a fantastic positive story that we can think about and, 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 and we can work with. But there's also a negative one. And the negative dynamic is about conflicts. It's about inequalities, that even in you know, my country, um, inequality is increasing. And you see, you see that social gradient I talked about everywhere. Environmental pressures, huge. New diseases, as we've said, and, and resurgent old ones, uh, and increased demand, and of course cost constraints, because actually the 2008, 2009 recession is also having some impact even though we've got this you know, say extraordinary growth in some parts of the world. So there's a real negative. You know, I, could, I could also give you an extraordinarily gloomy uh, lecture uh, uh, about the future for health. Um, and of course, what we want to be is on the top one. Um, and I'm going to suggest um, how we can try the, something about how, how we can try and influence it so that we're in the top future, not the bottom future there, uh, and talk really about three things that I think will help us to do that. And the first one is this point about mutual learning and co-development. Um, and I've talked about it turning the world upside down because we often think about mutual learning as about how much we can teach other people. Um, you know the old adage, I guess, everyone's got something to teach and everyone's got something to learn. And it's very true in this environment. There is so much that people in Africa and other low- and middle-income countries can gain from the expertise represented in this room or in other rooms like this in, in, in Western countries about the science, about how you do things, about, about the professional training, about, about regulation, about all kinds of things that actually make a difference um, uh, for, for people's health. But actually, there's a lot of things we can learn coming the other way. And there's a point here where there's a important to have a degree of humility because we're facing these shared challenges and we need to face them together and be thinking about them together uh, and thinking about them in different ways. And I've just listed five things there, and I'm going to pick up two of them a, a, a bit later on, um, about the sort of things that we can learn, and, and there are examples of, of what we can learn from low- and middle-income countries, about how you engage people from the community much more. Again, if we think about those non-communicable diseases that we're all trying to struggle with, one of the things we have to think about is how we activate the community, how we activate patients, how we, how, how we activate citizens, how we engage many more people. And there are some fantastic ex examples uh, from around the world, and uh, one or two of which I will, I will pick up on. Um, but there are things like Mothers to Mothers in Southern Africa, where this is a, uh, across nine countries in, in Southern Africa, mothers with HIV um, are working with mothers to be with HIV about how they can prevent onward transmission to their children. Um, and actually, these mothers, you need some professional input, but these mothers are effective very effective way of delivering that message and making sure that people are actually doing the things they need to do to make sure that you, you've got a, um, uh, we're reducing that dreadful transmission. So enormous number of ways in which um, people are engaging community, family, and women that we need to think about in our different environment. Second one is that we all know in a school of public health that health is influenced enormously by lots of factors, all the determinants, including obviously education and work. Yet we put them in separate buildings. You know, we put our health into our, in those great palaces of hospitals very often and so on. Um, I think of BRAC, BRAC in Bangladesh, um, which isn't a health organization, but runs many of the health programs in Bangladesh. Um, 
it's actually an organization for working with what the founder calls the ultra poor. Um, and it will work with a young mother about the health of her child, but it will also offer her empowerment lessons about how she can develop herself. It can also offer um, or provide a microfinance loan so that maybe she can get some kind of, create some kind of enterprise. It can then also realize, I mean, Sir Fazli Arbet, who set this up, has done a sort of, you know, progressive sort of move on. It then realized, well, it's okay if, they've, if they're producing something in their homes, but they need somewhere to sell it. So BRAC now has a system of shops. It's also got a very good public health university, uh, as people will, will perhaps know, and so on. Extraordinary organization that breaks down those barriers which we, in our worlds, have put up. And uh, stuff there to learn about. Extraordinary technologies and, uh, and innovation in there. I won't go into any detail, but, but thinking about India, um, there are some really interesting new technologies that are coming out. Some of them around IT and, uh, and other cheaper ways of doing the same things as we do in some places, um, but actually doing them and going further. Bringing together public health and clinical medicine. In Ethiopia, for example, the health um, extension workers there um, know how to do, I mean, roughly speaking, know how to do 20 things. Ten of them are stuff that we would call clinical and treatment orientated, and ten of them would be things that we would think of in public health terms. Now, these are the people at the most local level. Um, and how do we make sure that we're knitting those things together in ways which we in the West very often don't? Uh, some countries are better than others at doing that. And the final one I'm going to come back to is actually training people for the job that needs doing and not just for the profession. Now, one of that led me and a friend, uh, an I uh, a Ugandan friend called Francis Masma, to get really pissed off, I guess is probably the right expression, with the fact that everything written about health in Africa is written by Europeans and North Americans. You know? None of it is written by Africans. So he and I decided that we would write, um, we would edit a book called African Health Leaders, um, which, and I managed to persuade Oxford University Press to, to publish it for us. And it's a book which is actually written by 22 African health leaders, people you've never heard of, but I'm going to tell you. I've got three names there. You may have heard of the bottom one, I suspect. Um, uh, and um, telling the story of the things that they have done, which in another context would, I think, be um, you know, really understood as being real leadership within health. But actually, in Africa, not much is written. It doesn't get into the journals and, uh, and so on. Let me tell you the stories of these three people, just very briefly. Um, Miriam. Miriam Wary, great lady. Um, graduated top of her class in medicine in Nairobi in 1976, um, and then did her uh, doctorate in public health on citizen and patient participation. So this is Kenya, 1976. You thought those were new topics? You see what Miriam was doing then. And basically what she was doing was she realized that in her, in, 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 the, in the large hospital, um, that the biggest single issue was what she described as the oral fecal link, which I won't explore any further, but you can work it out. Uh, and, and that actually doctors could maybe do a bit of mending, uh, sort it out a bit, but they couldn't solve it. And actually, you, the only way you could solve it was in the villages, was working with the village women, particularly, and about separating clean and dirty water. I mean, all, everything that goes alongside that. And she built up a whole network of community health workers um, in Kenya. Um, other people were doing the same elsewhere, and, and, and that has developed as, as she's really one of the mothers of the community health worker movement in, uh, in, in Africa. I'll come back to that as well. Um, the second one, um, Pasquale Mukumbi, I'm afraid I spelled his name wrong, should, Mukumbi, it's an M, not an N, um, was a young man who in 1976 became health minister for Mozambique. Now, if anyone knows the history around this, that was uh, 1974, they threw out the Portuguese and then entered on a 10-year civil war just the moment to become Minister of Health. <laughs> All the doctors have left um, because actually, um, you know, they were Portuguese, basically all the doctors, and then you were in this civil war. And health became a, a, an issue, actually, in the fighting. And Pascual found himself running this, and now he actually, extraordinarily enough, was both a doctor and a nurse. He, he'd trained in exile in three European countries, and he'd actually trained as a nurse in Switzerland because he found he could work as a nurse, whereas he couldn't necessarily work as a, uh, as, as a doctor. Um, and he, the biggest issue that was facing him, he, he, the biggest thing he decided to prioritize um, was safety of um, mothers in labor and safety of mothers in delivery. And he introduced a new cadre with a Canadian doctor whose name I have just forgotten, helping him. Um, it may come back to me. Um, uh, of uh, Tecnico de Chirurgia or Cirurgia, who speaks Portuguese here. Um, uh, but um, 
technical assistants um, who he trained to do obstetric surgery. Um, and he did this um, in a very sophisticated way um, and uh, it's still continuing. In rural uh, Mozambique, most mothers are delivered where they are delivered, um, uh, where they need surgery um, by these, these medical technicians, these surgical technicians uh, in the country. Uh, and in peer-reviewed journals like the British Journal of Obs and Gynae, you can see that their results are as good as the physicians. And they're cheaper, about half the price. And of course, these technical uh, uh, physicians, these technical uh, uh, surgeons, um, stay in the country because they can't work out anywhere else. Whereas the doctors from Mozambique will emigrate, Portuguese speaking, to Brazil or to South, uh, South Africa or wherever else. So an extraordinary triple win. win. And, and as a peer-reviewed evidence shows that the complication rates for these, uh, or the, the, the quality issues, are the same whether you're dealing with a physician or with one of these properly trained surgical technicians. At this point, I refer to your dean, who around roughly the same time at the end of the 70s was actually training, I think, medical assistants in Tanzania. In, in again, and the same sort of principles, I think, of, of getting people who are not doctors to be doing things um, uh, that traditionally we have equated with doctors. Really challenging stuff, and that, that system is, is a really impressive system. And then the third one, Agnes Binaguajo, uh, these, these, these have all written their stories in, our, in this book. Agnes is Minister of Health for um, um, Rwanda. Um, and you may be aware that 22 years ago now there was the, the ghastly genocide. Um, and that when they came back together as a country, uh, health was one of the things they focused on around the theme of I am a Rwandan, not I have my tribal identity, but as building up I am a, I'm a Rwandan, they focused on health. And they built what is in many ways the best universal health coverage system in Africa, in a relatively small country. Um, but they've done it because of sheer political determination uh, and a recognition that this was one of the things that you as politicians can work with the people locally to actually create, and with help from outside. Quite a lot of aid money has gone in. But it's a really interesting story how over 20 years they've done that. Um, so these are, these, these are fantastic people. These, these are people um, who are extraordinary health leaders. I'm, I may have run the biggest health system in the world, but these guys have got a bit of a harder task. You know? If I was starting up here, uh, starting down here and trying to pick, pick the thing up. Um, now, these are great stories. but There are some practical relevance to them, and I'm just going to pick up the practical relevance in a moment. But actually, this next slide is not practical. Um, it's just my favorite bit of technology. Um, you can see there's a gentleman there with a painted stick. Does anyone know what that painted stick is for? I should be offering a $5 Canadian dollar award here or something. It's the most wonderful bit of technology. Go on, have a go. He's spot on. <laughs> it's a dosage stick. Now, uh, when you're tackling river blindness, uh, onchocerasis, the way you have to do it is you have to break into the life cycle of the, of, of the fly, uh, which lays an egg, which uh, pa produces a parasite, which then gets into your body, and eventually bacteria from the parasite actually cuts the optic nerve. And what you have to do is you have to dose everyone in a village uh, for 10 years before you break into the life cycle. And what we do, and I shared something called Site Savers, but actually it's the Africans here, the African um, program on coronavirus control, which really led the work here and did the science. Um, is that they have got something like 600,000 men and women like him in villages, because you haven't got a doctor on every corner. You can't have this handed out with your flu injection. This is done once a year, and it's done by this gentleman with three bits of technology. Well, perhaps four. I suppose pen and paper are two bits of technology, aren't they? So they record the names of everyone. And then you also have the stick. And the stick is painted normally in the colors of your flag or your football team. And as you'll notice... There's one spot on there, two spots on there, three spots on there. And you stand that stick next to every member of the, everyone in the village. And if you're my height, you get three tablets. If you're a little fella, you get one tablet. Isn't that a brilliant bit of technology? You know, the, the most simple sort of way of, of, of having a dosage measure, uh, 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 as you say. So that's the second or third bit of uh, technology. And then behind every hundred of these, there's somebody who's collating all the results and sending it straight up on a smartphone to the cloud. So this must be the future, a stick and a, stick and a smartphone uh, for, for, 
sorting out technology. I say that, I don't know how relevant that is, but it's just uh, my favorite bit of technology is, uh, is this one. Let me pick up the two big issues that I think um, really can influence us. One is this point that we've already touched on about the surgical technicians and the changing uh, who does what, sometimes called task shifting. I called it here skill mix change. I chair this thing in, in, in the uh, in parliament called the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Global Health. We worked with the Africa APPG to do a study of examples of skill mix change in rich countries and in poorer countries. There's uh, a Mozambique example up here. The example from the UK, the example from Ontario was to do with uh, nurses in far-flung rural areas working uh, to a greater, to, uh, doing more than they would be doing if they were working in Toronto or, uh, or Ottawa or wherever else in Ontario. Uh, Mozambique was there. The example from the UK was uh, introducing nurse prescribing, which happened when I was chief executive, and, and changing who does what within the system. Now, what's interesting about these things is that actually we do it. We do it quite reluctantly. You know, our, our medical and nursing and other professions are, you know, rightly in many ways, uh, both concerned about safety but also jealous of their territory. Um, uh, whereas actually, if you haven't got those resources and you haven't got those baggage, maybe you're a bit freer to experiment a bit more and try some different things. We did quite a big study of all of this, and we found that... Um, a lot of these fail because actually they're, they're, they're done by, led by p politicians or whatever and not done properly and say, why don't we get nurses to do this? Okay. Um, so we did the, the obvious thing, which is we looked for the success factors for those that succeeded. And the sex, success factors are what we would call in, in England the bleeding obvious. Um, they are actually, why don't you start by having decent leadership and planning what you're going to do rather than just reacting to the politician saying you should do it. Get your job design right. Make sure you recruit the right people. It's not every nurse in the UK that can prescribe. It's only the right ones. Make sure there's some formal training and progression. Make sure there's supervision and the ability to refer on when you're out of your, 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 your comfort zone or out of your, your competence zone. And make sure there's some recognition and teamwork. And this, this spiral upwards was the common factor on the ones that worked. Now, if you are the Canadian Medical Association or the British Medical Association, you would much prefer this figure. Uh, this is how to make sure it fails. <laughs> you know? um, and these are the ones that failed. Lack of leadership and planning, not doing it properly. Poor job design, recruitment. No formal training and adequate supervision. Now, the interesting thing is I can apply this to my country. You can probably apply it to yours. Um, this one applies to how we did nurse prescribing. We did it carefully. We did it well. 2003, it came in. It was quite a big issue. Now it's not an issue. You know, it just happens. This is what we did with healthcare assistants and led to some of the problems in the UK. Healthcare assistants was people brought in off the street almost with different levels of training to do some of the work that nurses have been doing traditionally. Um, and it wasn't done properly, and as a result, we got some real major problems around quality. Um, but this is really important stuff in terms of, um, in terms of the future, because the biggest cost in healthcare, wherever you are, is people... Um, you've got this mass market. We've got to be thinking about how we widen it out. We've got to be learning the lessons from these examples, some in our own countries, uh, but some, the bolder ones, often in low- and middle-income countries. But the other one I want to just raise is, um, I had mentioned Miriam Werry and her community health workers. This is how her work was transferred to Harlem. Um, you can't read this, uh, well, you probably can, actually, but um, it was literally moved from Kenya to New York by this group, City Health Works, and this man here, Dr. Prabhat Singh, who works with um, uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, who people may know. Economists in the room will know, of course, he's an economist institution here. Um, and, and basically, they have said they are using the same techniques, different circumstances, but the same techniques about local people working with local people. So if you're trying to reach the people we often think of as unreachable, then actually you better go and reach them where they are, and you better do it in the way that they do it. Um, and they use the same methodology. Um, and some of it is here, uh, but he makes the interesting point. The fundamental relationship between community and health systems is foundational to achieving universal primary health care. You've got to get it right in the community if you're going to get it right in the health system. And community health workers are the best position to help the world reach that goal. Really important, critical point. We're starting to do this in mental health in the UK. We haven't been quite as uh, bold as they have in Harlem. So that's my second point. There's an awful lot for us to learn that actually if we're going to tackle these things, and get onto the positive environment, then we need to be thinking about uh, how we do this. But the third topic 
with what um, we call uh, health creation. And what I mean by health creation is about um, building healthy and resilient communities and healthy and resilient people. Uh, how do you actually get that going? And how do we create a health creating society? Because we sure haven't got one now. This great quote from WHO England, uh, Europe rather, which you would probably recognize. I don't suppose many people would challenge it. The modern societies actively market unhealthy lifestyles. Um, I was in my hotel this morning, and I thought for a moment I was in the classic situation where I'd just been down to the, to the gym at the bottom to get fit and all the rest of it, and then I couldn't find a staircase to get up. I had to go in a lift, you know? You know and th those famous pictures you've probably seen of the escalators taking you up to, the, to your gym, <laughs> uh, uh, and so on. You know, we, we've set up a world where you don't get to walk um, unless you're poor, uh, uh, and you don't necessarily get the, the food you need and, uh, and everything else. So, we, so what do we do to, to sort of compete that? Well, here's a great quotation, a traditional African saying, isn't that, isn't that great? Health is made at home. Hospitals are for repairs. And what's interesting about that in lots of different ways is this notion you can make health. You, know, actually, you can build resilience. It sounds like Chinese medicine, doesn't it? Um, it also sounds like um, uh, Professor Barker's hypothesis, doesn't it, about what happens in the womb in the first five years is so fundamental. Well, the Africans got there as well. And actually, what you're doing, how do you, how do you build uh, health? And this is a real issue. I just drew out two sets of figures about Canada and ourselves. And this is, this is from UNICEF. This is child health and well-being. Interesting, because they measure child health being in terms of overall well-being, uh, material well-being, health and safety, education, behavioral risk, and housing and environment. The things that you would expect as public health people are affecting people's health and well-being. Um, and they look at where we, we rank. Uh, well, we're in a close tie down here <laughs> with Portugal and Austria. Not terribly good uh, for various different reasons. And these are important discussions for us to get into with our policymakers uh, to understand um, how the different things impact. Uh, so we end up with these overall scores, which means something and nothing. But the individual things, um, obviously, are, are significant. Um, well, the other one I just pulled out about um, Canada was about healthy life expectancy. Um, and you know, this is your life expectancy. This is your healthy life expectancy. This is your healthy life expectancy with diabetes and hypertension. I'm glad I don't have it as I'm older than that. Um, uh, and that'll ban, actually, but yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, the, these, these are statistics, again, we need to get in front of the politicians to understand that it's not just this figure we're talking about. It's this one. And again, there are some interesting charts drawn up by the OECD and so on which show that most of us live to about this age in, in, in the West. But if you're in Norway, almost all of that time, you're healthy. Um, if you're in Portugal, actually, interestingly, most of that time, you're unhealthy, um, which is to do with lifestyle factors and so on. Um, but these are really important issues uh, for us all in terms of health creation. But the message I have here, of course, is that we can't leave this to the uh, uh, politicians and to the professionals. Um, uh, I think um, I was given the statistic that, 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 that was quoted to me by, by Don Philippon earlier today, that is it 25% of, uh, of, of health gain is achieved from, um, uh, from what happens within the health system itself. Whatever the figure is, it's of that sort of order, 25, 30, 40. We've actually got to have, in our country, a new movement that actually make, makes employers live up to their responsibilities. Employers do an awful lot in my country to damage health. Um, so there could be a bit more about actually what they do in their working conditions. Um, and we have, we have interesting developments in my country, like um, the City Mental Health Alliance, which is a group of big city firms in London uh, getting together to try and do something about mental health. Educators, citizens, health and horticulture. We've now got a great program run by the Royal Horticultural Society now. Arts and health. All of this we've got to bring together um, in what we are saying in the UK, or what a small group of us is saying in the UK at the moment, is in 1948, we had this great vision. We'd bring together everyone who did health services together to create a health service for everyone. What would it be like if we could bring everyone who, have, who was engaged, who influenced health together, for a new movement to actually build a health-creating society? Um, and I and friends, uh, colleagues, have produced a manifesto on this, um, which at the moment we are talking with our new government. I don't know if they're listening. <laughs> you never can tell with government until they suddenly do something. Um, and it may be not what you've asked them to do. Um, but the point is, this must be a way to go forward. We can't just spend all our time thinking about the healthcare system. We've got to be thinking about, not just thinking, but creating the leaders 
so that the people who are talking about this are not public health people telling educators you should do things, but actually educators and employers being leaders in this field as well. And there's a few hopeful gains. And then the final thing I just say on this, it's also personal. It's about all of you. Uh, it's about all of us. Um, and again, we mentioned earlier that you as, um, uh, as Canadians um, have a great tradition of working in other countries and working with partners around the world um, in ways which some other countries are less good at. Um, and I think we have roles here as advocates, as change agents, making things happening, but also these sort of exchanges and partnerships, which I spend a lot of my time with in Africa, between, in my case, British institutions and African institutions. Um, and I do observe, and again, we were talking about this earlier, that global health has become the great expansion in public health, as it were, hasn't it, in terms of where students are asking for, for courses to be developed and so on. Uh, and we're seeing that. So I think there's a real role for all of us there. So what have I said? Just about got it through in my 40 minutes. Um, I talked about those, the, those two choices. You know, there's a, there's a positive. How can we accelerate, accentuate the positive and, 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 and damage the negative, as it were? And I think there are three big themes that we need to be thinking about that all come under this sort of notion that we're in it together, that this is one world and it's our health. One is about some really respectful mutual learning and co-development sourcing innovation where it is, working with people, developing new ideas with people around the world. Secondly, shifting the focus away from the professional health care system into everyone having a role to play in, in creating health. And thirdly, none of this will happen without personal engagement. Um, you all know my stories of the African health leaders, the individual and the relationships they form are fundamentally important. You wouldn't have a public health school here if you didn't have a number of individuals um, who came together. And this is an appropriate point to end a, 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 a Douglas R. Wilson uh, uh, lecture, isn't it? Unless you had a number of individuals who said, we're going to make it happen. Um, and that's the truth of it. You know, we've, we've got some options here to try and move in the optimistic direction and move away from the negative. Thank you very much. This is a very inspiring and informative. We now open the floor for questions. Uh, and just raise your hand and find the mic around. Those who are online can type a question. Thank you very much. In my lifetime, a primary global issue has been population growth and overpopulation. Um, other than the obvious, do you see that improving global health will, and uh, lower child mortality might help us tackle uh, overpopulation? Or is that another issue altogether? Uh, well, you open up a, an enormous set of, set of issues there. But uh, the, the simple answer is, is yes, of course, it must, because, again, economists, and I expect public health people in the room, will know the fact that as a population gets wealthier and more children survive, women have um, less children. So fertility goes down. So you get what's called a demographic dividend. You know? So when a, when a country shifts from being low income to being middle income, you, you then get this one-off boost of a young population. India's got it at the moment, actually, in many ways. You know? Although India is nevertheless the capital of maternal uh, at the moment. So, you, so you've got that shift. So there is a shift there, but you've got to reinforce it. Um, uh, but it, it will have a role. But there are much bigger issues than what you're talking about, about women's control, uh, uh, about contraception and, uh, and everything else that goes with that. And, and it's those political social issues that are responsible, I think, for a huge, well, are responsible for a huge amount of maternal mortality uh, globally is because of the role, the, the position women are in. But that deserves several PhD theses, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you very much for a very good uh, presentation. I, I train as a registered psychiatric nurse in England and got good education down there. And um, I, my question is about mental health. Uh, when, when, when the, way, the way we see it, when 
uh, the Western world comes to promote uh, health in, in places like Africa, it's usually the physical health that is emphasis are on. And mental health is quite a big problem out there with all the conflicts and stuff that is going on. I train as a psychiatric nurse in England, wishing to go back home and work uh, in the system. And as you did mention that uh, citizens have to engage the government. But our political systems are so difficult that it's, it's very difficult to go back and, and do stuff. I just wonder from, from your country, where I train, what, 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 what sort of partnership or development of people like Ox who would like to go back home there and work in mental health, uh, that system does take care of. The other thing is that when we were trained in England, the idea was to um, remain and help with the mental health uh, uh, professionals of England. It was more for the English need at that time. Yeah. Can that be reversed? Can that be such that I'm trained and I send back home or help to go back home and, and, and do that. And I think that mental health is important in yeah. Africa. I think that's a terrific question, if I may, may just dive in on that. Um, and mental health is, is a particularly good example because it is so culturally um, connected in, in so many different ways that actually what you may learn in England, you don't want to go and impose those ideas on a completely different culture. Actually, they may not work in Canada, what you learn in England. You've still got to adapt to, 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 a, different, to a different culture. Um, but I recognize exactly what you're talking about. I chair something called the Zambia UK Health Alliance, which is all the British groups working in health in Zambia, trying to get our act together. So once a year, and it happened to be last Tuesday, uh, we have a conference in London where we bring together as many of those groups working in Zambia from the UK um, together with the Ministry of Health or the Permanent Secretary or the Deputy Minister, you call them, um, uh, from, from Zambia to talk about the plan and to work out how to do it. As in one of those, we, we, we ended up developing a, an M-Med in psychiatry and mental health to be delivered, if anyone knows Zambia, in Chinama um, Hospital in, in, in Lusaka. Um, and that was a really interesting experience because we had um, Brits and, and, and people of African heritage who had become Brits or maybe weren't, um, who, were who were trying to work with people locally and, and to some extent fuse their different ideas about how you'd actually do it. You know, you come um, with, a, with, a, with a British education um, with something to offer, but actually you've also got to be humble and understand where they're coming from. And actually the fusing of the two was a really interesting uh, example. It was, it was hardest to do in, in mental health, much easier in things like anesthesia, probably where the patient's asleep, I don't know. You know, you know, and doesn't get involved, but, you, you know, but, but, but it's that sort of thing. And what we do through the Zambia UK Health Alliance is um, we are working with the diaspora, people like you, um, and working out ways in which they can be involved back in their own country in ways that sort of fit with that. And there's some great examples in Addenbrooke's Cambridge Teaching Hospital. Nurses who want to do that um, can, uh, they may not actually be able to go to Zambia, but, but they can... Um, they can work for free one day in the hospital, thereby providing support for one of their colleagues to go. So 10 nurses will do one day, and one of their colleagues can go and work in Zambia for 10 days. So, so there's a whole lot of different ways in which people have been trying to do that. But it needs to be done really sensitively, even more in psychiatry than, than, than elsewhere. Um, but really important stuff. And fantastically educational for the Brits. You, know? you have to go back to first principles and work out what psychiatry is about. Thank you for your presentation. My question um, is a little bit broad. You might have touched on it already a little bit. Given the significant gap in resources and infrastructure between Sub-Saharan Africa and the Western world, how can poorer countries attract public health expertise at a meaningful scale, on a meaningful level that, that will reflect progress and not just for the media or for public relations? Yeah, it's it's a um, it's a very long journey. You could ask another question, which is: so Brits and Canadians and others have been trying to help these countries for fifty years. Have you made any difference? You know, why haven't you solved the problem yet? You know, that's the sort of question we sometimes get in the UK. It is a massive um, problem that is not just about health; it's about how you grow the economy and so on. Which is why the British. 
uh, international development uh, uh, project is also about growing the economy, helping um, supporting education, as well as trying to support um, health. We have a responsibility as health people, specifically on the health side, and I think the biggest single issue is training health workers. We're good at it. You've got a fantastic university here. We've got fantastic universities in the UK. Um, so, you know, there's a great ability to, to train people. I think one of the things we can do is, is train people, use these sort of exchanges uh, that we're talking about. But, again, this is more than several PhDs' worth of, uh, of response. This is, this is really, really difficult stuff that people have been grappling with forever. Shall I, take two, shall I take two or three together, do you think? Are we thinking so this question comes from online. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. You'll be happy to know that Canada and Alberta are doing a really great, are doing great work at patient engagement and co-design of safety and quality of care. I work for the Canadian Patient Safety Institute's Patients for Patient Safety Program linked to the World Health Organization and get to hear oh. about this. Uh, patient safety was recently labeled as a public health issue and patient engagement as a blockbuster drug of the century. I wonder if you can advise on how to accelerate engaging patients, families, and citizens as partners. Right. So this person works with Sham Syed, presumably, at the WHO. I suspect she may say yes on the phone to you. Um, but there's a really interesting program at WHO called the Patient Safety Partnership Program, which is people in our countries, our richer countries, working on patient safety, trying to work with people locally on, on patient safety around the world. Um, so I think that's a good program. I think there are other specific programs we can do. The Safer Surgery Checklist. Do people know the Safer Surgery Checklist? If we would get that implemented across Africa, that would be phenomenal. You know? So I think there's a bit about actually focusing on, on some individual um, things. But I think the bigger issue that is underlying that is a problem in our country as well as in, in other countries, which is patient safety isn't yet at the top of the agenda. Um, we are still... We don't measure when we do the results of our... Uh, of, of our health service in the UK. We tend to talk about activity levels um, uh, and death rates and a whole lot of other things which relate to patient safety. But we don't always pick up the, the data around patient safety. So I think there's a big underlying issue there. But I think globally, the sort of partnerships that are done um, uh, from the, through the WHO thing, but also targeted initiatives and safer surgery um, and, of course, safer childbirth would be, um, you know, would, would be very much up there. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a medical student here at the U of A, and my question is about non-communicable non diseases, right. which you mentioned we need to find innovative ways to tackle. Yeah. And I was wondering if you knew of any specific examples of um, initiatives or policies that have um, been, been effective, for example, be it you know, subsidies for healthy foods or sugar taxes or other types of policies that you think might be um, ways we could look at addressing the issue. Well, again, it's a huge question. I'm tempted to pass it to your dean to ask him how you're handling that amongst uh, First Nations communities, actually, in the north here. But, but some of this is about how communities work and, and culture. I don't know if you want to say anything on that at all. No, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that'll, be, that'll be another lecture. Um, but but the, I, I, th I think what we can learn from, from uh, lower-income countries is the sort of stuff that I'm talking about, which is actually about how you involve people, because actually we know that many... I don't know, uh, non-communicable diseases, um, it's, there, there are lots of predisposing factors. There are lots of risk factors. You'll have done the top five risk factors as produced from the Global Burden of Diseases report, won't you? Um, and actually, how you influence those is profoundly cultural. And I think that um, the most interesting example that I'd point to probably, I suppose drowning is a non-communicable disease. Uh, um, and, and ch uh, but the, the, the example is, is Bangladesh, um, where actually... By working with women in village groups, um, you've seen a massive drop in under five mortality um, from a whole range of different um, uh, non-communicable factors. Um, so I, I think there are some really good examples out there. But it's, it's all conceptually, it's quite simple. It's actually about how, you do, how you're working with the local community and getting them engaged. Because you as a medical student and as a doctor in the future, um, you'll be in the same position as Miriam Wherry. You can deal with 25% of the problem, but actually the rest of the problem is out there. Okay, two more questions. Thanks very much for that um, big picture overview. 
just a minute ago you, you highlighted uh, uh, training and education as, as a, a high, if not the highest priority. But I think in terms of health worker um, uh, capacity building, our effect in Canada for sure has been uh, hugely negative. We've strip mined South Africa of its uh, health workers, and then the Zimbabweans go to go to uh, South Africa. So, uh, do you want to comment on uh, a response that might um, yeah. turn that around? Yeah, thank you for that. I'm very glad you raised that. This, this, you're, you're talking about what colloquially gets called the brain drain, aren't you? I think, which is that health workers in Africa then move somewhere else because it's. Um, Sorry to point at you, <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, because there are better opportunities. Um, uh, and it's a really significant uh, problem in a, in a whole lot of ways. Um, I argue within the UK, because I was chief executive of an organization that was doing this. You know, we were, the NHS is a global organization. You know, it really is. And we've even got Canadians working for us. Um, uh, and that our response is about working to train more people in those countries. So we need to do it. That's one of the reasons why I, I argue so strongly about education, um, and supporting education elsewhere. And we have developed quite a big partnership system around that. Um, but there are two other points that need to be borne in mind with this. Um, firstly, again, as you, you I suspect know, that there was a um, WHO um, concordat on this, the um, compact, I can't quite remember quite the language, but it was on um, the recruitment of health workers internationally. And it makes the very important point that there are two sides to this. There are the rights of the migrants as well as the rights of the country. And both need to be respected. And some of the rights of the migrants issue was the fact that if you work in a country where you haven't been paid for three years, um, where you're in appalling conditions, well, maybe actually, you know, maybe you have some rights to migrate. Um, and actually, when you get to the country you've migrated to, whether it's Britain or Canada, you've got rights to be treated in the same way as people who are already there um, and not be put down into the, the bottom jobs within the system, which, again, sometimes happens. But beside that, you've then got the rights of the countries to um, have a health workforce and to retain as much as possible of the labor they've got. And there are various proposals in that, um, including the fact that every country is meant to produce a, an annual report on what they're doing about it. I don't know whether Canada has, the UK hasn't. Um, but we've, uh, I asked a parliamentary question about this the other day and haven't yet got a reply <laughs> about when we're going to publish it. You know, so there needs to be quite a lot of pressure around this for the, for the reasons you say. But it is quite a complex process. Um, and the biggest single issue is that not enough people are being trained. Um, the last figures I saw suggested 300,000 people had emigrated from African countries with some level of health training. Um, if they all went back, it would deal with about 10% of the problem. You know? So it's a significant problem, but the biggest issue is they're not training enough. So that's where I think as well as everything else, that's where I would put the biggest focus, and that's why I always talk about education. Thank you very much <coughs> Excuse me for the presentation. So my question is around the Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development mm. Goals. And there's been a lot of criticism around the Millennium Development Goals and arguments provided for why they failed. So what opportunities do you see for the new SDGs, and what would you say might be the key ingredients to ensure their success? Well, I think the Sustainable Development Goals are ridiculously ambitious, and of course they won't be achieved, you know, at the scale that's set. I mean, we, we should start that. doesn't mean to say you shouldn't be ridiculously ambitious. Better to go for something big and almost get it, than to go for a low target and, and achieve it. Um, uh, so, so that's the, the first thing to say, because they're, they're huge. And, and there is a slight problem in that, because that means countries can pick and choose which ones they'll aim for. Because there's 17, and each of them in health, there is one of those 17 is on health, and there are 13 key indicators below that, aren't there? Uh, sorry, there are 13 targets below that, and each of those have got key indicators. So there's a bit of pick and mix. Um, and I think the really important thing will be which are we going to prioritize? Where, where are we going to work together? And hopefully, Canada and the UK and other countries will prioritize the same ones so that actually you really are getting energy around maternal mortality or, 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 or whatever it, it is. So it's opportunities, um, but it's not a plan. You know? It's aspirational. It's, 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 it's big picture sort of stuff. But, but, uh, but it's partly a response to the Millennium Development Goals, which people said were very narrow in health. So you've got non-communicable diseases in the Sustainable Development Goals, but that means you've got a hell of a lot of priorities. 
So you've got to focus again. Again, uh, these, these answers are pretty inadequate to these. They're, they're asking such big questions. Well, wonderful questions. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we have opportunity to uh, engage a lot, Chris, uh, outside at a reception, which we are all invited to go to. But before we, we close, I want to remind you that there are evaluation forms that I would like you to fill out uh, to help us plan our next uh, uh, lecture series. And um, thanks very much for coming. And thank you again, Lord Chris, mm -hmm. for the wonderful presentation. Great.